this reading is the healing at the pool the healing at the pool sometime later Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals now there is in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool which in Aramaic is called Bethesda and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. 
So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. But Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Amen. So I, um, I was thinking this week, it's usual when you've, uh, when you've got a service that just kicks off the new year, or it's something that I always do, I always pick that famous passage from Paul, uh, the passage where he talks about forgetting that which is behind and straining towards that which is forward, but I thought, is this something different just for us to focus on? And I've been thinking recently, twice I've told the little anecdotal story about my friend who was asked by a doctor in making a decision about his health um, whether he want, wanted to choose to live because that was the most important thing for him. And I've been thinking a lot recently about that. And so this week I was reminded of this story. And so I want us to focus on just one thing. Do you want to get well? It's a strange question to ask somebody who is hanging around a place that is all about getting healed. Do you want to get well? I'm going to write four words here, just so that you've got something to look at, if you don't like looking at me, and I hope that I spell them all right, and we're going to track them through this story. So we'll just put the word well at the top. I'm going to look at four things. I'll unpack them. Inclusion. This is an interesting word. You might wonder what this is about. Interrogation. I know Clive stood behind me, so I hope I'm spelling these right. Interruption. Probably spelt that wrong, actually. I think I have, haven't I? I've put two R's in that. Oh, is that right? Right. And initiative. Let's see what we can get out of this story together as it stands and for us too. I wonder firstly whether this story, well certainly as it kicks off, is a story that tells us a little bit about inclusion. Because you've got a man who clearly is on the floor and he claims to be powerless. He can't get into these waters when they're stirred. And nobody is helping him. I wonder whether he's the kind of guy that people step over in order to help others and forget that he exists. Is the point initially of this story that Jesus identifies that one, that one person, and engages with that one person who is traditionally missed out of the feast of healing? 
So we could say, in line with how John himself writes the gospel, that this is a story about inclusion. Somebody on the margins is given hope again. But then I find it really interesting that Jesus asks him that question. Do you want to get well? It sounds a bit like an interrogation for me. Do you really? Are you serious about being well? Do you really want this? And I wonder, and it's, you know, this is me reflecting and maybe reading into the text. I wonder whether Jesus is trying to find out whether he's comfortable where he is or whether he's really ready to say yes to long and lasting change. Do you really want this? Are you really serious about this? And it sounds a bit like an interrogation, doesn't it? And the man says back to him, probably what he's said for years now, a narrative. And it's a narrative that is hopeless. It's despairing. He says to Jesus, well, yes, I do, but I've got nobody to help me. While I'm trying to get in, he says, someone else goes down ahead of me. He's trying to get in in his own power, which you would do. I'm not condemning that. But it would have been better if he would have had assistance. So he tells Jesus a narrative. I wonder how many times, given that he's been there for, how long does it say? 38 years. I wonder how many times he's said that to somebody. How many times he's repeated that narrative. And yet I think Jesus' work is going to come and disrupt or interrupt that narrative. It's almost like in Jesus' question, he's also saying, are you prepared for the narrative that you live by to be broken? I think when you've been in the same place for so long and said the same words over your life for so long, you can become comfortable and conditioned to accept nothing different than the story that you hold. I remember watching the film Shawshank Redemption. Are people familiar with that film? So it's like it's based primarily in a prison. And I think there's a guy who's been wrongfully um, convicted and he starts educating the prisoners and he starts working for like the head of the prison in finance because he works in finance. But he creates quite a community around him because he's educating people. And there was what, there's one old man in the film and uh, he gets released. He gets his ticket to freedom. But he's been in prison most of his life. And there's a scene where he goes back to where he lived. And that's where he's going to get a flat. And he walks into the flat. He has a look through the window and he sees all the newness and he sees everything different. And then he immediately puts a noose up and he kills himself because he cannot break free from the institutionalized life that he's had. And so he, he'd rather stay in that than embrace the new. Now, when I watched that, I thought, well, I don't blame him because it's a tough thing to do, to transition out of something you're used to and into something different. And I think that's why nowadays a lot more work goes in to uh, offenders who are released being integrated better into society to manage the mental health and the disruption. But I think sometimes we can live so, so conditioned lives that to contemplate anything different or even go outside of what we're used to gives us a dissonance that makes us either want to run back to the conditioned thing that we're used to 
or not face reality at all. And Jesus sometimes, let's be fair, Jesus' healing will be an interruption for this man. It will break the narrative pattern for his life. And yet I think there's something about this word initiative as well. When Jesus says to him, do you really want to get well? I wonder whether Jesus is saying, are you ready now to take responsibility for your life? Have you got the courage to say yes to a hopeful narrative and to keep walking away from the old things that you once was? Are you prepared to take ownership now? Will you put the mat back down when the religious people, the religious conformists bully you and stand against the freedom that you have now found? When they insist that the miracle that you are breaks the law and they're more interested in putting you back on the mat for their satisfaction than praising God for taking you off the mat and into a new life. Will you take the initiative to stand firmly against that which would make you lie down again in shame and embrace a narrative of defeat and despair? Now, there's a lot more to this story than I'm focusing in on. But I am obsessed with the, with the question Jesus asks. Do you really want to get well? It's like Jesus is saying, I've seen you. I've heard about you. I've noticed that you're on the floor. And I know the narrative that you have. But my question is, do you really, really want to be well? Do you really want the narrative that you've built your life on to be interrupted? And are you ready to take initiative for your life, to take responsibility once again for the giftedness of your life and to walk away from this life into a new one that is not marked by shame, but will require you to continue to stand against those who would bully you back into the prison of shame. Now, of course, we know the man gets healed. We know that he walks off with his mat. We know that the religious power people who are more enamored with rules and regulations are affronted that he's carrying a mat rather than praising God that he's walking with a mat. They see it completely differently. And of course Jesus comes and he warns this guy, continue to be taking responsibility. Don't shirk the responsibility for living your life in a way that is in conformity to the work of Christ. Don't go back. It's an interesting story, isn't it? Inclusion, interrogation, interruption, initiative. I think these are the words that call to me. And I think about this story for us. And I'll personalise it in a, in a way where I'll address the you in the room rather than making it all corporate. Listen, we know we've been on a journey together We've looked at the idea of God being a God of inclusion, a God who sees us, a God who sees um, the people who are outcasts, who are on the margins, the people who are overlooked, Jesus identifies and stands in solidarity with them and wants to do in them the good that he can do for anybody. But I just want to give a little bit of a warning because this has occurred to me recently. We all suffer in some way with a sense of not feeling at the centre. Unless we're bullies and we do power grabbing. But all of us do. But the thing is we don't display our sense of lostness and marginalisation in exactly the same 
ways. There are people who have been schooled and brought up with an approach, which is great, which is no matter what, you just get on with it. And sometimes it's the people that we think are getting on with it that would say that they are the most overlooked. We have to be so careful, don't we? That we don't overlook those who are genuinely suffering on the inside because they look like they've got everything together. Now, the good thing about this story for me is even though people might not see your inner sort of sense of marginalization because you look like you've got it together, Jesus does see it. God sees all things. He sees our inner suffering, our mental anguish, just in the same way as he would have seen that person physically in front of him who was on the margins. We're all included because technically the gospel tends to tell us that we're all lost anyway in the first place. But sometimes we can favour Perhaps, and this sounds a little bit conservative in mindset, we can put too much energy in those who would never really want to get well. But Jesus interrogates this man, and I wonder whether the question for us this morning, for you, is do you really want to get well? In your life, do you really want to be whole? Or changed? Yeah. Do we really want this? Do you really want this? Are you ready to have narratives broken in your life, to walk away from narratives of despair and hopelessness, in order to embrace the miracle that God has in Jesus Christ for you. Like I said, when you've been in the same place and said the same things to yourself, you can condition yourself to believe that there is nothing more than what your current position is. And are we ready, if we're going to answer the question, yes, we want to be well, are we ready to take the initiative and the responsibility to have the courage to live in the yes to that question? Paul puts it this way, doesn't he? He says, stand firm in the liberty, in the freedom that you have in Christ and don't let yourself ever be again subject to any form of slavery. Paul, of course, is talking to it about a certain legalistic kind of slavery, to circumcision and the law. Are we ready to take responsibility? Listen, God sees us all this morning. Jesus sees us all. But Jesus asks us all the question, and I think it's a great question to ask. Do I, do you want to be well for 2024? Do we want change? Do we want wholeness? Do we want growth? Are we serious about this for 2024? Are we still going to be at the end of 2024 parroting out the same complaints and the same narratives, the same tuts, moans and groans about the church than we did this year? Are we still going to be lay on the floor saying, oh, well, you see, we would really like this, that, and the other? I wonder sometimes, and I witness this in a lot of churches, culture has changed, friends. Culture has changed. It's no good lying on the floor saying we would like this, that, and the other when Basically, let me tell you now, if we want to reach out to different people groups, they don't get up at half past ten on a Sunday morning. They don't come and be sanitised amongst us. They swear 
They talk about things. If we want our church to grow, then perhaps we need to have a bit more initiative about asking the deeper questions. If we really want to grow, and Jesus says, do you really want to grow? Then my question is, are we ready for everything to be interrupted? Perhaps Jesus might say, what you want, I don't want to give to you. I want to give you something different. Get up and walk in this now. It makes me extremely frustrated that we folks that gather in a church, we expect people to come and gather in a church at the same time as us to do exactly the same things that we do. And so when we trial out, and many churches do it, they trial out missional activities. And when it doesn't result in people coming in a Sunday, they stop the missional activities. Surely it's about bringing people into the kingdom of God, not putting them on, on a seat on a Sunday morning in church. If we really want to be a well and whole church, we've got to be open to the Christ who interrupts and disturbs our narratives and disturbs our precious things. We might not be lay on the floor like this paralyzed man, but we certainly might have been in positions for most of our lives and we find it hard to step aside and allow God to interrupt us, to realign us, to rearrange us, to do things different with us. This morning, well, this morning most people will be in bed, but most Sunday mornings, I have to say, if you go past the sports centre in Haywood, it's families with their kids playing football. That's what they do. If I have a Sunday off and I go to the gym that I'm a member of, it's packed. People don't necessarily wake up now because our culture isn't like this and think, so my big question sometimes is, should church be on a Sunday anymore? Isn't that a radical proposal? And then what is church anyway? Ugh. And if we want young people... What kind of young people do we want as well? Do we want the ones who are getting the A stars because we know that they might have nice debates with and stuff like that? Or do we want the kind of people my dad engages with in Haywood as a youth worker who will run us ragged? I don't know. Are we willing? Or maybe God might say to us, that's not my narrative for you now. I've got something completely different. Are you ready to have the courage and bravery to embrace maybe something different that I've got. This is what I think is our question. If we ask the question, do we want to be whole and well as a church, then we've got to open ourselves up to the possibility of Jesus interrogating us a little bit. Do you really want this? What are you really precious about? Are you able to let go of that for 2024? Are you willing for interruption to take place, for mess? Are you willing in that interruption to take the initiative when people point the finger and say, you're not doing church anymore, this isn't church, this isn't making me comfortable, when you might be engaging with people through whom God is doing great work? I think this is a really challenging passage and it's a really challenging phrase. Are you willing? Do you want to get well? I think we need to be open for the sake of the future of the kingdom of God to being interrogated, questioned by the Spirit about our motives for doing what we do. I think for the sake of the future of the kingdom of God, we need to be ready to be interrupted, to have narratives taken from us, perhaps to have power taken from us, so that we can embrace something new and lasting. And in all of that, we need to take the initiative to be co-workers with Christ in his work of building the kingdom. For God is not our servant in our desire to build something that pleases us. He is our Lord 
He is the one that leads us forward. And we have to have the courage to say yes to life and to say yes to the responsibility that comes with throwing away the old narratives, the things of despair, and embracing the new. Let's have the boldness and courage in 2024 to be those who set our feet upon a new race. Amen.